This week on Fireys, too hot in the kitchen. There's still sparks coming out ten floors up from where the fire was. Now fire threatens the entire building. Nothing is easy and everything's dangerous. Dangerous, <laughs> dirty and unpredictable. We still have visible fire inside the hopper. But somebody has to do it. Crossword. And from bad... Those you've always wanted a convertible. ...to worse. Ankles, femurs, tibias, they're all broken. <laughs> Glebe's D platoon is approaching the heart of this city after a fire has spread from a restaurant kitchen. We've got Piermont Fire Station going as well. We've also brought the CA2 along. 50 staff and 100 customers have already been evacuated from the building. There's actually fire up in the roof, so something had caught a light in the exhaust fan. Some of the ceiling had fallen out. We dumped a couple of extinguishers up into there. Because the fire has jumped into the complex ducting system, the firefight has moved from the kitchen on the first floor all the way to the 11th floor. When we got up to the roof to check the, the exhaust, there's quite a few sparks shooting probably 20 to 30 metres in the air from the exhaust. So we've shut that down and we think there's still fire in there, so we're just dumping water down the, down the exhaust ducting now. Tomo climbs up even higher for a closer look. Yeah, no worries. Fighting a rooftop fire is not the greatest of fun. You've got to be very careful of the edge of the building. You're dealing with darkness. You don't know what you're walking on. You assume that it's a metal vent that it's going to hold your weight. So you've got to test everything as you walk on it. Everything is just a challenge in that sort of situation. Nothing is easy. Uh, and everything's dangerous. We're just going to switch the exhaust fan back on to see if we get any sparks flying out. That'll give us probably the only indication we can get on whether there is still fire in the ducting. The thermal imaging camera operated by the city platoon is not offering good news. So just dump it in. There's still sparks coming out 10 floors up from where the fire was, so that's a, that's a fair way for that heat to be travelling and how, how much damage that's caused along the way and how many little fires there are within that ventilation shaft, you don't know. Each year, fireys in New South Wales extract nearly 5,000 victims from their vehicles after an accident. And today, Liverpool has its fair share. OK, let's get some good traffic management going. It's a very busy intersection. The first is a collision involving two cars and a truck. An elderly female driver is trapped in one of the vehicles. 80? You don't look 80. That's a bit of a noise. next to Penelope, OK? Gordo and Cobby have to remove the rear and driver's side door so paramedics can get access to the 80-year-old driver. Just a couple of noises, nothing to worry about. All right, Penelope. Here we go. You got it. Gordo is the newest member of the platoon, and today he gets a chance to prove himself. The people need to see that you've got basic skills, and then you build up on those skills, you work together, and I think that earns the trust. So I'll lay the seat down and we'll just slide her up it. It's important to keep movement to a minimum to avoid further injury. Okay. I've got it on this side, guys. Penelope, we're just laying you back down, okay? That's as far as it's going to go. Oh, I've got it here. This is a critical moment for the patient, and teamwork plays a big part. Alright, so I'm going to come further up with yep. you, right? You, you won't clear out. Oh, I'm going to clear with one, two, three. Thankfully, the driver only has minor injuries. Pretty easy, pretty quick. Five minutes. Good bit of panel beating. <laughs> Convertible. 
fire in the first floor kitchen of a Sydney restaurant has travelled up the ventilation shaft. And it's still burning somewhere in the 10 floors of ducting. Yeah, that ducting actually doubles back underneath and put the water in there, but it's only going to settle in the bottom of this sort of pipe here. Where they were lobbing the water in, it actually went down and they went back up again and sort of twisted around before it went down into the building. So really, you're just sort of lobbing water into a bucket. The sparks are just coming out sporadically. The fire's got to be deeper. And yeah, I can see about three metres into it. We're identified. We'll take that panel off and cut it out. Get water into there. And they need a power four on the roof. Tom O and Mickey Patton from City HQ need to cut a more direct route to the fire. Quite often if it is from a kitchen, there's just been grease flowing up through there for years potentially. So you could have a fire that's just going to continually burn all the way up. Yeah, just for your information, it seems that what's burning here is actually the insulation on this vent. So there could be several hot spots all the way down this vent that we just can't see at this stage. Over. That's not what the fireys want to hear. Yeah, that's received, over. Yeah, we see that and understood. Uh, heavy Rescue 8 will go on to assist uh, Rescue Top 93. After successfully freeing an 80-year-old woman from her vehicle, B Platoon's Heavy Rescue is diverted to assist at another accident involving a car and a truck. No, oh, keep coming. Stop. Stop. This time, the car is barely recognisable. And the most frightening part is that a young female passenger is still trapped inside. They've already got to work extricating uh, the patient on the, the passenger side. The small sedan has collided with a truck and been pushed 20 metres. It's lucky the truck is empty, otherwise the force of the collision could have been much worse. The teenage passenger is trapped, and not just by her injuries. The dashboard has pinned her legs and imprisoned her in the vehicle. Ankles, femurs, tibias, they're all broken. The feet were tucked up under the dash because the dash had come down onto her, her legs, so they were curled up underneath. Now it's up to Cobby and Pearl to do all they can to help. And we don't want to be pushing things over under her legs or crushing her legs any further than they already are. While Cobby and Pearl will need to draw on all their experience, Leib's restaurant emergency still simmers somewhere. The hard part is identifying if anything's still on fire. Liverpool's heavy rescue has been diverted to a serious accident where a small sedan has collided with a truck. The passenger in the car is pinned by the dashboard and Cobby and Pearl are helping other rescue crews free her. It's a mess. There's bits of plastic, bits of metal, bits of glass just everywhere. It's not a nice little scenario. It smells, it's hot. Uh, you've got the heat of the engine coming through the firewall. Uh, you've got spilled oil, blood. It can get quite intense sometimes, but you just uh, focus on what you've got to do and, and um, worry about that later. The young woman has multiple leg fractures, so crews need to work quickly but can't afford a wrong move. I was in the um, front of the car just watching uh, to make sure that anything that we moved, the dash or the, the side of the car or anything like that, wasn't impinging further onto her legs or um, going to cause her any further damage than what had already been caused. In this case, removing the doors is not enough. Virtually the entire car has to be prized away from the patient. We pretty much focus on basically cutting the car away from, from the patient. That way you can sort of separate yourself from, from any emotional side of it. The hydraulic gear we have that we use, usually if at motor vehicle accidents, is low volume, high pressure hydraulic gear. It's, it, it makes the job super easy. Aside from the weight of the tool, it's literally no effort for us to, to bend a door out of the way or to cut through a B-pillar of a car. The job of the person in the car and, and, uh, and that sort of worker-patient relationship that you strike, it's, it's very important, you know. It's, they have no idea what's going on. They've just had a, a, a terrible accident. Um, and they rely on the people that, uh, that are with them to, to comfort them, to reassure them, and let them know what's going on. At last, she's released from the crushed vehicle, and the Ambos prepare to take her to hospital.
you, you see her get put on the gurney. She's conscious. She's talking. That's a good feeling to know that, as, as in pain as she is, and and um, she's going to be sore for quite a long time, but she's going to be okay. She'll go to hospital, get the best of care, and uh, it's, it's a good outcome. Glebe's D platoon is up on level 11 of a building in the CBD, trying to get closer to a fire that is spread up through the ventilation system. That's the hard part, is identifying if anything's still on fire. But Tomo just got lucky. He may have found a way to beat this blaze. Yeah, looks like I've got a uh, inspection panel here on the back side. Just let me know when you've got it over. You've got a hose in there, and you can see how it's work over. Go straight down, you've got good action visual all the way. We'll be able to get good water down there. OK. We're still going to bring CO2 in from the bottom. Uh, we will need exhaust fans on for that. CO2 is heavier there, so it will just fall back down. So we're going to suck it back up through. Carbon dioxide will help starve the fire of oxygen. Hey, can you please start the exhaust fans up over? If they put the fans on at the wrong time, you could get a reignition of the fire coming straight up the ventilation shaft, and then you get a you know fireball coming straight at you. So everything has to be done through a series of steps. If you can start firing those CO2 cylinders in, over. CO2 driver, here they come. Yeah, they're coming with the fans on and the CO2 going through, what they're doing is they're pushing cold air up, basically, which smothers any oxygen in that ventilation shaft and potentially puts any fires out that are there. And we were putting water in from the top at the same time. So there's a bit of CO2 coming out of that now, no more sparks, so I'm going to pump some more water into it. By then, I think I'd, I'd be pretty happy that I think we've got it all. Now we're just dumping water down the vent, Aaron penetrate any hot spots that might be in this shaft. But Tomo's got some heat of his own to deal with. You're kind of confined inside, you've got your flash hood on and your helmet and your gloves. There's really nowhere for the uh, hot air to escape. So you just kind of start to boil inside. I don't suppose you brought some water up with you now, mate. Get a bit of water into that hose if you want some. <laughs> I don't want to drink that water out of that hose, mate. <laughs> It wasn't really until I got down to the ground I realised we'd actually been there for a couple of hours. So I've been working pretty hard for that period of time. And I was genuinely knackered. It's been a tough day at the office, but Tomo proves he can take the heat when it gets too hot in the kitchen. Okay. So what we have is a factory fire and there's a high potential for dust explosions. Liverpool's night shift offers a reprieve from motor vehicle accidents, but poses a dangerous challenge for B platoon. It's a fire in the yard of a furniture factory in Sydney's inner west. So Chris knows that an unusual and potentially dangerous scenario awaits them. And the potential for extreme damage and or uh, life threat to firefighters and the likes is great. The fire is deep inside a hopper, a sawdust filtration system. We went as backup and when we got there, it was full of burning sawdust. The sawdust from all the MDF that they use when they manufacture cabinetry and cupboards and things. Uh, somehow, I'm not sure how, but um, part of the, the hopper is ignited where all the dust is stored. Uh, very hard to access. There's one chimney at the top which is smoking. Tonight, Scott Stanley Hanley is relieving for Dan, B Platoon's regular fiery. The possibility of a dust explosion is always present with any type of dust, especially combustible. Stirring up the dust inside can create a chain reaction, leading to a violent explosion. You might want to put BA on as well. Yes. Their best defence is to pour water onto the narrow opening. But the fireys also need to attack it from below. A dangerous move because it could unsettle the dust. Go. Another night shift for Glebe, and as usual, they don't know what the shift will bring. So at the beginning of each shift, we have to make sure that the trucks are ready to go out. That means checking all the gear that's on them, make sure that the gear is in good working order. That includes anything that requires batteries or fuel. And there's actually like a little checklist that we have to go over. 
one of the things that we check a lot is the tick, the thermal imaging camera. It is an important piece of equipment. It can save lives, it can help, help us find someone that's inside a fire, it can help uh, pick up where the hot spots are as well, things that you might not be able to see, so it's a really important piece of equipment. When it comes down to it, if it's an emergency situation, it could be the difference between life and death. On average, fireys get a call out every four minutes. And just like Liverpool, Glebe has its share of motor vehicle accidents. Tonight, it's a call out to an incident on Sydney's infamous Parramatta Road. Yeah, it's soil. Just got a small little bumper car accident here. We've got a free car in BA. It's only minor, but we've got uh, quite a bit of oil here. It might be transmission fluid and radiator fluid. It's quite slippery and it's, it's probably heading down there about 80 metres or so. So we just need to cover it up. Otherwise, it's going to cause more accidents. So we're going to cover it up with some spag sorb and that'll take the slipperiness out of it. A quick and easy fix for D Platoon until Dino discovers a bizarre problem. Uh, we've just got this car still running here, but the keys are in the ignition and the door's locked, so it's somehow still running. The engine is overheating and is at risk of catching fire. Whose car is this? Is that yours? At Liverpool's potentially explosive hopper fire. Irene and relief firefighter Scott Stanley Hanley are nominated to head into the danger zone and unblock the bottom of the hopper so they can get to the source of the fire. Once it starts to come out, just you get out of the way. Back. Yeah. Okay. Irene sprays a safety mist while Stanley probes for the fire. The only way to unblock it was to stand underneath it with the ceiling hook and pull the blockage out. It was dirty and wet and horrible. <laughs> Under a heavy drenching from Irene's hose, Stanley resorts to dragging the muck out by hand until he reaches the fire. Yes, uh, from the first point, we still have visible fire inside the hopper. Requesting permission to get a stream of water up onto the inside. As soon as we've already disturbed it. Over. With that course of action, over. Drop it out, thank you. Knowing that too much disturbance of the sawdust could cause an explosion, Chris decides to take a risk and blast water straight up inside the hopper. Stand by, Chris. Stop. Stop, stop. We're going to get a second line. This is a protection line on you guys while you're at work. Stanley sends up the water jet, and Chris's gamble pays off. Who said being a firefighter was glamorous? That other funnel behind you, is that blocked as well? Why, yes it is. How about we take care of that as well? I'll just speak to my chimney sweep here and uh, see how it feels about that. Stanley might have Dan to thank later. I got Stanley to do a shift for me and it's always an ongoing joke when somebody does a shift for you and they get absolutely smashed. Afterwards, they were sending me photos while I was offered a Bucks party. Photos of Stanley all messy, sweaty, and thought that I would show him sympathy, but um, that's not really in the fiery's nature. Oh, I need a hug. <laughs> After a solid saw dusting, Liverpool can finally cool down, dry off, and go home. As for Dan's mate Stanley, he knows what goes around comes around. The luck of the draw, he's uh, on a Bucks night having beers with his friends while I'm here doing his dirty work for him, so that's all good fun, it's part of the job and um, yeah, no complaints. A routine three car pile up on one of Sydney's busiest roads has just become more complicated for Glebe's D platoon. The vehicle sandwiched in the middle is still running with the keys locked inside. 
Mate, what we're going to do, because your car's overheating, right, as you can yeah. see, yeah. we've got one guy trying to get in through your through your yeah. door here, the door yeah. handle, but at the same time we'll fire a CO2 extinguisher under the bonnet yeah, yeah. to try and just get it to the air intake to, to shut your engine down. OK. Jimmy gets to work on the bonnet. Should we get the first aid out? <laughs> Jimmy, settle oh, You're going to flip the car over onto the car behind you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it. Well, that did the job. Break the window. Let's give him his keys and he can go to hospital. Your keys, mate. Thank you very much. A routine checkup gives the car owner the all clear, but his old Astra is not so lucky. Yeah, that's it. We've done our job. Well, almost. You can sort of be part of the community. Sydney's Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras is one of the biggest events of its kind in the world. And right in the thick of it, Glebe's D platoon arrives to keep a close eye out for any emergencies. Fire and Rescue strategically places appliances on the north and south side of Oxford Street, so we're on the north side assisting Darlinghurst, so we're standing by with them to respond. It might be a float that could catch on fire. They're using all sorts of things. Also, balcony collapse. There's a lot of old terrace houses that get overcrowded on nights like these, so there's a big chance of collapse. It has happened in the past. I mean, again, it's one way that we can sort of be part of the community. We're here to sort of, you know, show our presence. Having the truck here is advertising Fire and Rescue New South Wales, so we just, we just mingle with the people and we're ready to respond at the same time. to be sort of part of the spirit of things, you know, and allow people to have their photo taken with us and it makes them feel good and makes us feel good. Although for Dean, it may be one photo opportunity too many. Woo! I blew it! <laughs> <laughs> oh, look what he did! <laughs> Next week on Fireys... <laughs> 600 degrees and pushed to the limit. It's hot, it's smoky, we can't see a thing. Uh, you're down on your hands and knees. And from stormy weather to lethal light show. Whoa! We cancel that yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. Is that a driver, right?